Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We move forward with our summing up and discussion and in this um, lecture we will have a sum up of the last three modules. So, in module 10 we looked at, we started to look at conservation laws and we looked at the Indian Forest Act and the Forest Conservation Act. In the Indian Forest Act we saw that this act was promulgated in 1927 and it is primarily a mercantile act. So, it is an act to consolidate the law relating to forests, transit of forest produce, duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. So, this is the primary objective of this particular act. It is expedient to consolidate the law relating to forest, transit of forest produce and duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. And in the arrangement of sections, we saw that the first two sections as always are short title and extent and interpretation clause which basically is related to the definitions. Then chapter 2 deals with reserved forests where the government has all the rights. Chapter 3 deals with village forests. Chapter 4 deals with protected forests. Then we have chapter 5 of the control over forests and lands not being the property of government followed by duty on timber and other forest produce control of timber and other forest produce in transit, where we saw that the government can control the movement of timber and other forest produce. Then of the collection of drift and stranded timber, penalties and procedure, cattle trespass of forest officers, subsidiary rules and miscellaneous provisions. Now in section 3, we saw that uh, how the reserve forests are created. So, the power to reserve forests is with the state government and they may constitute any forest land or wasteland which is the property of the government or over which the government has proprietary rights or to the whole or any part of the forest produce of which the government is entitled. So, the primary thing is forest land or wasteland where government should have some rights that can be made into a reserve forest. Now, to make a reserve forest, the government starts by making a notification, then as soon as the notification is uh, published or issued, then there is a bar on accrual of forest rights. So, the rights get frozen from that point of time and then there is a proclamation by the forest officer based on the notification, then the forest officer enquires into the rights of the people. So, the primary objective here is to uh, note down who has what rights so that those rights can then be taken over by the government. So, there is inquiry by the forest settlement officer, powers of the forest settlement officer to uh, do the inquiry, the forest settlement officer has the power to enter upon any land, survey, demarcate, make a map and the powers of a civil court in the trial of suits. Then it talks about the extinction of rights. So, if people have not put up their claims, then uh, those rights can be uh, made extinct. Then treatment of claims relating to practice of shifting cultivation, power to acquire land over which the right is claimed. So, the forest settlement officer can do th three things. If the claim is admitted in whole or in part, the forest settlement officer can exclude that land from the limits of the proposed forest. So, he is essentially moving the boundaries back so that this land where people have claims is not included in the proposal or he may come to an agreement with the owner thereof for the surrender of his rights or he may proceed to acquire such land in the manner provided by the Land Acquisition Act of 1894. Then order on claims to right of pasture or to forest produce, record to be made by the forest settlement officer and in this case two things are important to note. The particulars of person have to be recorded and the particulars of the property or the claim that also has to be recorded. Then it also provides for a provision of appeal against any order to, 
uh, by which any person is aggrieved and then finally the government publishes the notification so when all of these things have been done the time of preferring the claims has elapsed all the claims have been all either settled or if they have moved into appeals then the period of appeal is over and the appeals have been disposed of when all of those things have happened then the government by notification will declare the forest to be a reserved forest and after this uh, uh, notification it is translated into the local language and it is published in the neighborhood of the forest now the government still maintains the power to revise the arrangement that was made and no right is acquired over the reserve forest except as provided in this act and rights are not to be alienated without sanction and once the forest has been made into a, a reserve forest then a large number of prohibitions come inside so there are several acts that are prohibited in these forests and if people uh, do these prohibited activities there is also a clause for punishment then section 27 gives the state government power to de-reserve a forest however this power has now been modified by section 21 of the uh, forest conservation act 1980 which says that the state government cannot de-reserve a reserve forest without prior approval of the central government so this is how a reserve forest is made then the act also talks about village forests and what can be made into a reserve uh, into a village forest any land which has been constituted into a reserve forest so basically the government has all the rights over this land and then the government can give this rights to the village to make it a village forest then chapter 4 discusses the protected forest and in the case of protected forest the procedure is very simple it is not that rigorous so there is no need for an elaborate inquiry there is assumption of being correct until proven wrong and the declaration need not wait till the rights get settled so it is done quickly it is done in a non-exhaustive manner so that the rights of the government are protected then section 30 deals with power to issue notification reserving trees so in a protected forest the government can declare any trees or class of trees as the reserved and if the trees are reserved then a large number of uh, prohibitions kick in then as before here also we have publication of translation of such notification in the neighborhood followed by power to make rules for the protected forests. so the state government can make rules so the authority to make rules is the state government and then section 33 deals with penalties for acts in contravention of notification under section 30 or of rules under section 32 so basically if uh, in the protected forest if something uh, is not done right if there is a contravention then the penalties are kicked in through this section 33 now in this context we should also uh, discuss the differences between RF and PF, reserve forest and protected forest. So a reserve forest cannot become a protected forest, but a protected forest can become a reserve forest. Now this is coming from the first sections in both of, uh, in, in the making of both of these forests. What can be made into a reserve forest and what can be made into a protected forest. So because in a protected forest, it is a forest land, so it can be made into a reserve forest. However, a reserve forest cannot be made into a protected forest because it is barred from the lands that can be declared as a protected forest. Notification after full settlement of rights in the case of reserve forest, but notification is possible pending settlement of rights in a protected forest. We have the provision of a forest settlement officer in the case of reserve forest, but not in the case of protected forest. And we saw before that the FSO should normally be a person who is not holding any uh, forest office other than that of the forest settlement officer and it is also possible to make a group of three officers to do the job of the forest settlement officer now all these provisions are there in the case of reserve forest 
because there is a complete settlement of rights. So, the FSO has all the duties to note down who has what rights in what areas and to acquire those rights. And so, an FSO is required for RF but is not required for PF and so there is no provision of a forest settlement officer for a protected forest. No new rights can accrue in the case of reserve forest, but rights alleged to exist at the time of notification of protected forest will be allowed to continue under section 29.3. Restriction on alienation of rights in reserve forest under section 24, but no such restriction in the case of protected forest. Products can't be sold or bartered in the case of reserve forest under section 14, but there is no such restriction for a protected forest. And every act is prohibited unless permitted for a reserved forest, but every act is permitted unless prohibited for a protected forest. So, basically the prohibitions are much more in the case of reserved forest than in the case of protected forest. In RF, everything is prohibited unless it is permitted by a forest officer. In the case of PF, nearly everything is permitted unless prohibited. Now, boundary is well demarcated for a reserve forest, but not for a protected forest. Trespass is an offense for reserve forest, but not for protected forest. And compensation as a punishment for damage is there in the case of reserve forest, but not in the case of protected forest. So, these are the differences. Then in chapter 5, we saw the control over forests and lands not being the property of government. So, even on those lands, the government can have control. And here we saw that section 35 talks about protection of forest for special purposes. And what are those purposes? Things like protection against storm, wind, rolling stone, floods, avalanches, erosion and so on. So, in those cases, the government can uh, say that we have rights and we are going to protect these forests. In section 36, we saw power to assume the management of forest. In case of neglect of or willful disobedience to any regulation or prohibition under section 5, 35, the preceding section. Or if the purposes of any work to be constructed under that section so required, the state government may after notice and writing to the owner of such forest or land and after considering his objections, if any, place the same under the control of a forest officer. So, in this case, the government can assume the management of forests that lie with private persons. And when these forests are managed, then the net profits are paid to the owner. Then section 38 talks about protection of forests at the request of owners. So, even the private parties can request the government to take over the management of forests. Then chapter 6 deals with duty on timber and other forest produce. And here we saw that section 39 gives the power to impose duty on timber and other forest produce to the central government. So, the central government may levy a duty in such manner at such places and at such rates as it may declare by notification in the official gazette. Then there are also powers with the state government. Then chapter 7 deals with control of timber and other forest produce in transit. And in this case, the government has the power to make rules to regulate the transit of forest produce. So, in this case, the government can say what are the routes through which timber will move or forest produce will move or what are the transit permits that will be required, where, when and where the checkings will be done and so on. So, all these powers are with the government. Then section 41A is power of central government as to the movement of timber across custom frontiers. So, if something needs to be moved across customs frontiers from uh, one country to another, then the central government will have a say. Then we have penalty for breach of rules under section 41, government and, and then government and forest officers not liable to damage for forest produce at a depot all persons bound to aid in the case of accidents at depots. Now, when it says all persons, then the uh, wordings of the section, they describe what is all person. It is every person employed at such depot, whether by the government or by any private person. So, all person does not mean anybody who is loitering around. 
but any person who is employed either by the government or by a private person has to uh, provide assistance. Then chapter 8 deals with of the collection of drift and stranded timber. So, if there is a timber that is drifting somewhere, the government will come in and say that okay, this is our timber unless and until it is proven that it belongs to someone else and similar is the case with stranded timber. If a uh, timber is found stranded somewhere, then again the government will uh, come in. So, certain kinds of timber are deemed to be the property of the government until title they are to proved and may be collected accordingly. This is section 45. Then 46 says that uh, a notice has to be served to the claimants of drift timber and they will have to prove their claim. And then we have the procedures on the claim preferred on such timber and government and its officers are not liable for damage to such timber. And before the claimed timber is delivered, there are payments to be made by the claimant. And as always, if the uh, payments are not made, then they may be recovered from the claimant. Then section 51 says power to make rules and prescribe penalties. So, the state government can make rules to regulate a large number of these matters. Then chapter 9 deals with penalties and procedures, where we saw section 42 deals with seizure of property liable to confiscation. And we saw that confiscation means that the property will become a property of the government. Now, before it becomes a property of the government, there will be a seizure of the property by a forest officer. And what can be seized? Any timber, forest produce, tools, boats, carts, cattle and anything that was used in the commission of the offence that can be seized. And then it talks about the procedure to be followed. Then there is also the power to release property seized under section 42 on a bond. Then it talks about the procedure, what will the magistrate do, what will be done if the property is a perishable property. So, in that case the magistrate can ask for the property to be disposed of through the sale. And in this case the money that is uh, recovered, the proceeds of the sale, they will be given to the party that will win in the case. Then section 59 talks about appeals, then property went to western government, punishment for wrongful seizure. So, if there are forest officers that or police officers that are misusing the provisions, then there is also a punishment for them. Then there is penalty for counterfeiting or defacing marks on trees and timber. And uh, in this case, it is not just defacing, but it is also putting a spurious mark. So, or uh, property uh, on uh, or penalties for changing the boundary marks. So, that is the boundary pillars. So, in these cases, you have more stricter punishments. Then there is section 54 power to arrest without warrant. So, in the case of these um, punishments, which are punish uh, these offenses that are punishable with imprisonment for one month or, or upwards, there is the power to arrest without warrant. And power to arrest without warrant means that all of these offenses have been made into cognizable offenses. Then section 66 says that there is a power to prevent a commission of the offense. So, the police officer or the forest officer role does not kick in after the offense has been committed, but they also have the power to prevent the commission of the offense. Then there are powers to uh, try offenses summarily, especially in those cases where the punishment is very less. So, for smaller offenses, the district magistrate or the magistrate of the first class, especially empowered in this behalf by the state government, may try summarily under the CRPC. Then there is also the power to compound offenses. Now, in the case of compounding, uh, a sum of money is taken in lieu of the offense and in lieu of the property that has been seized and is liable to confiscation. And after taking this money, the case is closed. No further proceedings lie. Then section 69 says, presumption that forest produce belongs to government. When in any proceedings taken under this act or in consequence of anything done under this act, a question arises as to whether any forest produce is the property of the government 
such produce shall be presumed to be the property of the government until the contract is proved. Then chapter 10 talks about cattle trespass and it says that the cattle trespass act is going to apply in the forest areas. Then chapter 11 deals with powers and indemnity of forest officers and it says that the state government may invest forest officers with certain powers so that they are effectively able to man this act. In particular, it also says that any evidence recorded under clause D of subsection 1 shall be admissible in subsequent trial before a magistrate provided that it has been taken in the presence of the accused person. So, this is something that is very different from that of the police officers. So, in this case, the court judgment of Abu Bakr, that is the Honorable Kerala High Court in Forest Range Officer versus Abu Bakr specifically said that because uh, the section 25 of the Indian Evidence Act only talks about police officers and because forest officers are not police officers, so the embargo contained in section 25 of the Indian Evidence Act does not apply to the confessions that are given to the forest officers. Then section 73 says that forest officers are deemed to be public servants, there is indemnity for acts done in good faith and forest officers are not to trade. Then chapter uh, 12 deals with subsidiary rules, additional powers to make rules to so the state government can make several other rules. Then we have miscellaneous provisions, persons bound to assist forest officers and police officers, land required under this act to be deemed to be needed for a public purpose under the land acquisition act and saving for rights of the central government. So, nothing in this act shall authorize a government of any state to make any order or to do anything in relation to any property not vested in that state or otherwise prejudice any rights of the central government or the government of any other state without the consent of the government concerned. So, basically the states cannot overreach their own territorial jurisdictions. Then we looked at the Forest Conservation Act. Now, this is a very small act, it is to provide for the conservation of forests and for matters connected therewith or ancillary or incidental thereto. So, it has a very small objective to conserve the forests and to provide for matters that are connected or ancillary or incidental to the conservation of forests. And we have seen that this is considered as one of the most powerful and one of the most draconian acts, even though it is a very small act and it provides for a very small punishment. So, section 2 puts in restriction on the de-reservation of forest or use of forest land for non-forest purpose. So, it says that for any de-reservation of forest or use of forest land for non-forest purpose, you need to have prior approval of the central government. Then section 2a provides for appeal to the National Green Tribunal. Section 3 says that there will be uh, an advisory committee constituted by the central government. Then there is penalty for contravention of the provisions of the act, section 3a. So, it says punishment is up to uh, is a simple imprisonment for a period which may extend to 15 days. So, it is a simple imprisonment, it is not a rigorous imprisonment and the maximum imprisonment that can be given is only 15 days. But because the deemed suspension clauses kick in, so it becomes very powerful. And who does the offences? The offences are done by authorities and government departments. Private persons are not charged in, under this act. Then section 4 provides for power to make rules and the central government can make rules and these rules have to be laid before both the houses of the parliament. Then we looked at the Forest Conservation Handbook, which is a compilation of the Act, the rules and the uh, court orders, which are useful for explaining things. And we also looked at the Forest Conservation Rules 2022. Then in Module 11, we dealt with the Wildlife Protection Act and the Forest Rights Act. Now, in the Wildlife Protection Act, we saw that this was enacted in 1972. And it is an act to provide for the protection of wild animals, birds and plants. 
and for matters connected therewith or ancillary or incidental thereto with a view to ensuring the ecological and environmental security of the country. So now we are not only discussing the economic security, the military security, but we are also now talking about ecological and environmental security of the country and this act is made for that. It has 13 chapters. So preliminary authority is to be appointed or constituted under the act, hunting of wild animals, protection of specified plants. So we saw before that it deals with both animals and plants and so we have these different chapters. Then it talks about protected areas which means sanctuary, national park, community reserve and conservation reserve. So these are protected areas. Then we have a chapter on central zoo authority and recognition of zoos, a chapter on national tiger conservation authority, another one on tiger and other endangered species crime control bureau, then trade or commerce in wild animals, animal articles and trophies. Then prohibition of trade or commerce in trophies, animal articles, etc. derived from certain am animals which are known as the uh, scheduled animals in this case. Then chapter 6 deals with prevention and detection of offences. Then forfeiture of property derived from illegal hunting and trade. So any property that is derived from illegal hunting and trade can be forfeited to the government meaning that it will become government property. The person will not be able to enjoy this property that is derived from illegal hunting and trade. And then we have miscellaneous provisions. Now the Wildlife Protection Act divides organisms into six schedules. Schedule 1 has the highest protection followed by Schedule 2 and then Schedules 3 and 4 have a high protection. Schedule 5 consists of vermins and Schedule 6 comprises of plants. Now section 2 in definition, it defines a large number of things. So animals includes amphibians, birds, mammals and reptiles and their young and also includes in the case of birds and reptiles their eggs. Similarly animal article means an article made from any captive animal or wild animal other than a vermin. So it defines things. Protected area means a national park, a sanctuary, a conservation reserve or a community reserve as notified under these sections. Weapon includes ammunition, bows and arrows, explosives, firearms, hooks, knives, nets, poison, snares, traps and any instrument or apparatus capable of anesthetizing, decoying, destroying, injuring or killing an animal. So basically what we saw here is that the definitions are very detailed. So it tries to ensure that there is no loophole that remains. In authorities to be appointed or constituted under the act, we saw that a director is appointed by the central government and a chief wildlife warden is appointed by the state government plus other officers are also appointed by the respective governments. Then there is a national board for wildlife at the national level which also has a standing committee. Then the functions of the board are described. Then there is a state board for wildlife in the state level and then you have the procedures to be followed by the board, duties of the state board of wildlife and so on. Now chapter 3 deals with hunting of wild animals and here it is important to note that there is a prohibition of hunting, not a ban on hunting. So prohibition means that hunting can only be done as provided under this act. So no person shall hunt any wild animal specified in schedules 1, 2, 3 and 4 except as provided under section 11 and section 12. So this is not a ban but there is a prohibition and hunting can be allowed under section 11 and section 12. Now section 11 says hunting of wild animals to be permitted in certain cases and the chief wildlife warden if he is satisfied that any wild animal specified in schedule 1 has become dangerous to human life not to human property but only to human life or is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery. So you can only hunt a, a, a wild animal in schedule 1 if it is dangerous to human life or if its own life is beyond recovery. It is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery and in these cases the chief wildlife warden can permit. Now, uh, before giving this permission, certain things have to be followed. No 
animal is to be killed until the chief wildlife warden is satisfied that such animal cannot be captured, tranquilized or translocated. So the first objective should always be to capture, tranquilize and translocate the animal and not to kill the animal. Then for the other schedules, the permission can be granted by the chief wildlife or warden or his authorized officer. Now in the case of schedule 1, this uh, power of granting the permission cannot be delegated, but in the case of other schedules, it can be delegated. Also in the case of schedule 2, 3 and 4, if the animal has become dangerous to human life or to property, which includes standing crops on any land, then the animal can be hunted or is so disabled or diseased as to be beyond recovery. So there is a clear cut distinction between schedule 1 animals and schedule 2, 3 and 4 animals. In the case of schedule 1 animals, it can only be hunted if it is dangerous to human life or if its own life is in danger. Whereas in the case of schedule 2 animals, it can also be hunted if the animal is damaging human property. Then in the case of schedule 1 animals, the, the power to give permission cannot be delegated. In the case of schedule 2, 3 and 4 animals, the, uh, the power can be delegated. Then it further says that the killing or wounding in good faith of any wild animal in defense of oneself or any other person is not an offense. Provided that the person when uh, this situation came was not under the contravention of any provision of this act or any rule or order made thereunder. So if the person was doing something illegal during which the animal attacked him and he killed the animal, so he will not have the protection of this section and any wild animal killed or wounded in defense of any person shall be government property. Then section 12 says that apart from these cases, there can also be grant of permit for special purposes by the chief wildlife warden for things like education, scientific research, scientific management which means translocation of wild animal to alternative suitable habitat and population management of wildlife without killing or poisoning or destroying any wild animals. Now in this case, we are saying translocation, but it is coming under hunting because capturing of an animal or coursing or driving it comes under the definition of hunting in the case of Wildlife Protection Act. Then collection of a specimen, derivation, collection or preparation of snake venom for the manufacture of life saving drugs. Now here again there are certain provisos that no such permit shall be granted in respect of any wild animal specified in schedule 1 except with the previous permission of the central government and in respect of any other wild animal except with the previous permission of the state government. So the government's permission is also required. The chief wildlife warden cannot take unilateral decisions. Then chapter 3a deals with protection of specified plants and it says that picking, uprooting, etc. of specified plants is prohibited. But here as well, the chief wildlife warden can grant permits for special purposes and cultivation of specified plants without license is prohibited. Dealing in specified plants without license is prohibited. The people who are dealing with these plants have to declare their stock and they cannot purchase these specified plants without um, a license and these plants are to be government property. Then chapter 4 deals with protected areas. So here uh, section 18 starts the declaration of a sanctuary. So it the declaration of a sanctuary begins with a notification declaring the intention of the state government to constitute an area as a sanctuary. Now in this case an area comprised within uh, uh, an area other than an area comprised within any reserve forest or the territorial waters because these are dealt with in another section that is section 26a. Now the notification has to specify as nearly as possible the situation and limits of such area. Then the protection uh, of the sanctuaries kicks in, 
there is an appointment of collectors. So, similar to the forest settlement officers, here there are collectors that are appointed under this act to inquire into the rights of people. So, the collector determines the rights, there is a bar on accrual of rights, so the rights get frozen till uh, they are settled. Then there is a proclamation by the collector, inquiry by the collector regarding the claims. Now, in this case, as in the case of the FSO, the, the collector has the power to entry in or upon any land and to survey, demarcate and make a map and the powers of a civil court for the trial of suits. Then there is the acquisition of rights. So, the rights have to be acquired. Then it talks about the acquisition proceedings, time limit and finally, when everything is done, then the area can be declared as a sanctuary. Now, 26A1B deals with the reserve forest areas or the areas in the territorial waters. Then section 27 talks about restriction on entry in the sanctuary. So, besides certain specified persons, nobody can enter into a sanctuary. Then there is grant of permit for special cases like photography, scientific research, investigation, tourism and so on. Then section 29 deals with destruction inside a sanctuary and any destruction inside a sanctuary is prohibited without permit. The permit is given by the chief wildlife warden together with the, st uh, the state government and the board. So, all of these have to together give the permission. Then causing fire is prohibited, prohibition of entry into sanctuary with weapon and we have looked at the definition of weapon before, ban on the use of injurious substances, control of sanctuary. So, who can control this, the sanctuary? The chief wildlife warden shall be the authority. Now, in this case as well, the powers of the chief wildlife warden are restricted for certain cases. Then 33A talks about immunization of livestock and in this case it is important to note that the livestock are permitted to be taken inside a sanctuary with the caveat that they have to be immunized. Now this is a distinction between sanctuaries and national parks because grazing and taking of livestock inside is not permitted in the case of national parks. Then there is an advisory committee registration of certain persons in possession of arms and every person residing in or within 10 kilometers of the area of the sanctuary. They have to register and there has to be a list of persons who have the arms that has to be given to the chief wildlife warden. And in all these cases, the chief wildlife warden has to permit. So, here it says no new licenses under the Arms Act 1959 shall be granted within a radius of 10 kilometers of a sanctuary without the prior concurrence of the chief wildlife warden. Then there is the power to remove encroachment and declaration of national parks. So, in the case of national parks, the procedures are nearly the same. Then declaration and management of a conservation reserve. In the case of conservation reserve, the areas must be owned by the government and these are particularly areas adjacent to national parks and sanctuaries and those areas that link one protected area with another. But the primary thing is that they must be owned by the government and in the case of uh, conservation reserves, there will be a conservation reserve management committee. In the case of a community reserve, what lands can be made into community reserve? It has to be a land that is owned by the community or an individual only that can be made into a community reserve and there is a community reserve management committee. Now, the central government also has power to declare sanctuaries and national parks if it has under its control areas that are not within the sanctuaries, then the central government if it thinks it necessary, it can also declare sanctuaries and national parks. Then chapter 4a deals with central zoo authority and recognition of zoos. So, there is a central zoo authority created under this act comprising of a chairman, members not exceeding 10 and a member secretary. Then there are several functions of the authority, specifically things like setting the minimum standards for housing, upkeep and veterinary care of animals, evaluating and assessing the functions of zoos, recognizing zoos, de-recognizing zoos and so on. 
then there are grants and loans to the authority and there is a fund now because there is a fund there will be an annual report and there will be an audit report and these will be laid before the parliament now it talks about the recognition of zoos acquisition of animals by a zoo prohibition of teasing animals etc then chapter 4b deals with the ntca the national tiger conservation authority so uh, the ntca is constituted under section 38l then the, it has officers and employees it has several powers and functions now some important functions are the approval of the tiger conservation plan assessing uh, and evaluating various aspects of sustainable ecology laying down normative standards but then there is this section 3801g which gives it powers even on areas that are not included in the protected areas or tiger reserves so it says ensure that the tiger reserves and areas linking one protected area or tiger reserve with another protected area or tiger reserve are not diverted for ecologically unsustainable uses except in public interest and with the approval of the national board of wildlife and on the advice of the tiger conservation authority so this includes even those lands that are private lands so it uh, the authority is given very wide powers similarly in section 3802 it says the tiger conservation authority may in the exercise of its powers and performance of its functions under this chapter issue directions in writing to any person officer or authority for the protection of tiger tiger reserves and such person, officer or authority shall be bound to comply with the directions. So it has pretty wide powers, very strong powers. Then there are grants and loans to the Tiger Conservation Authority. There is a fund because there is a fund. There again will be an annual report and an audit report that will be laid before the parliament. Then section 38V talks about the Tiger Conservation Plan. Then we have alteration and denotification of Tiger Reserves and establishment of Tiger Conservation Foundation in each state which has tigers. Then chapter 4c deals with tiger and other endangered species crime control bureau. So because there are wildlife offenses there has to be a bureau to control these crimes. So section 38y talks about its constitution. Then uh, we have the powers and functions of the wildlife crime control bureau and these again are pretty wide powers. Then chapter 5 deals with trade or commerce in wild animals, animal articles and trophies where it says that wild animals etc are government property and people who are dealing with them have to make a declaration of their stock. They need to have certificate of ownership. There is regulation of the transfer of animal there uh, and dealings in trophy and animal articles without license are prohibited. Then there is a provision for appeal and there is restriction on transportation of wildlife without uh, permission. Then chapter 6 deals with prevention and detection of offenses where it talks about power of entry, search, arrest and detention. So the forest officers and the police officers. So here again it talks about forest officer and police officer. They are given powers of entry into premises searching premises or vehicles or anything, arresting people and detaining people. Then section 51 talks about penalties and different penalties are given for different offenses and also for repeat offenses and for offenses that are done within protected areas and offenses against scheduled one animals. Then section 51a talks about certain conditions to apply when granting bail to the offenders. Then section 52 is important because it says that attempts and abatement are deemed to be contraventions of the provision or rule or order. So there is no difference between commission, attempt and abatement in terms of penalty. So in all these three cases, the same penalty that is given for uh, commission of the offense is given. Then there is punishment for wrongful seizure, power to compound offenses operation of other laws not barred, presumption to be made in certain cases. So when in any prosecution for an offense against this act, it is established that a person is in possession, custody or control of any captive animal, 
एनिमल आर्टिकल मीट ट्रॉफी अनक्योर ट्रॉफी स्पेसिफाइड प्लांट और पार्ट और डेरिवेटिव देयर ऑफ इट शैल बी प्रिज्यूम्ड अंटिल द कॉन्ट्ररी इज प्रूव द बर्डन ऑफ प्रूविंग विच शैल लाई ऑन द क्यूज दैट सच पर्सन इज इन अनलॉफुल पोजिशन कस्टडी और कंट्रोल ऑफ सच कैप्टिव एनिमल एनिमल आर्टिकल मीट ट्रॉफी एनक्योर ट्रॉफी स्पेसिफाइड प्लांट और पार्ट और डेरिवेटिव देयर ऑफ मीनिंग दैट इन दिस केस द प्रिजम्पन इज दैट द पर्सन इज गिल्टी अंटिल ही इज प्रूवन इनोसेंट एंड द बर्डन ऑफ प्रूविंग हिज इनोसेंस इट लाइज ऑन द अक्यूज ही हैज टू शो दैट ही इज इनोसेंट then section 58 talks about offences by companies and in these cases the director is held responsible together with any other officer that has a connivance or has uh, done wrong then chapter 6a talks about forfeiture of property derived from illegal hunting and trade then we have miscellaneous provisions that is officers are deemed to be public servants there is protection of action taken in good faith there is revo- uh, the provision of reward to persons now these rewards can be given out of the proceeds of the fine and they will not exceed 50% of the fine then there is power to alter entries into the, the schedules and this power is only with the central government only they can change the schedules then declaration of animals to be vermin that again is with the central government and it says that the uh, that these animals will be declared as vermins for specified areas and for specified periods as is specified in the notification then there is power of central government to make rules and power of state government to make rules and then it says that rights of scheduled tribes are to be protected so this is about the wildlife protection act next we looked at the forest rights act and the objective of the forest rights act is to undo the historical injustices that were done now the, uh, the forest rights act uh, if you look at the arrangement of sections you have short title extent and commencement definitions forest rights so chapter 2 and section 3 note down what are the forest rights and then chapter 3 deals with recognition restoration and vesting of forest rights and related matters so these forest rights are recognized if these forest rights were earlier with the uh, forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers but are no longer there then they are restored to them and if they have never been with the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers then they are vested to them then there is duty of the holders of forest rights then it talks about the authorities and procedures for vesting of forest rights offences and penalties and miscellaneous provisions now in the case of forest rights you have a very large number of rights including the right to hold and live in forest land community rights such as nistar and then you also have this provision that notwithstanding anything contained in the forest conservation act the central government shall provide for diversion of forest so the central government has to provide for the diversion of forest land for the following facilities managed by the government which involve felling of trees not exceeding 75 trees per hectare and then it lists down several of these facilities then chapter 3 deals with recognition restoration and vesting of forest rights and related matters where it says that in the uh, recognition the uh, the process will uh, uh, that the the government is recognizing these rights then it provides for certain duties in which case they uh, the it starts with duties but then it says that the people are empowered to do these things so there are certain duties and certain empowerments then chapter 4 deals with authorities and procedure for vesting of forest rights where it says that the vesting of the forest rights will begin with the gram sabha then it will go to the sub divisional level committee then it will go to the district level committee and it will fi- finally be monitored by the state level monitoring committee then it talks about offenses and penalties and offenses are done by members or officers of authorities and committees under this act so only they are held liable then we have miscellaneous provisions members of authorities etc to be public servants protection of action taken in good faith 
nodal agency and currently the MOTA is the uh, nodal agency, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. But it is not necessary because it says the Ministry of the Central Government dealing with Tribal Affairs or any officer or authority authorized by the Central Government in this behalf shall be the nodal agency. So, the nodal agency can also be changed by the Central Government. Then you have power of Central Government to issue directions, power to make rules and this is all about the Forest Rights Act. Then in module 12, we dealt with uh, the Environment Protection Act, the Water Act and the Air Act. And we saw that all three of these acts are very similar in a large number of provisions. The Environment Protection Act came after the Bhopal gas tragedy. So, the Bhopal gas tragedy happened in 1984, December and this act was promulgated on 23rd of May 1986. So, roughly after one and a half years. And it says that uh, uh, the objective of the act is the protection and improvement of environment and for matters connected therewith. If you look at the arrangement of sections, you have the preliminary sections followed by the general powers of the central government. So, it has power to take measures to protect and, and improve environment, appoint officers and uh, specify their powers and functions, power to give directions. There is an option of appeal to the National Green Tribunal, making of rules to regulate environmental pollution. Then chapter 3 deals with prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution, followed by the miscellaneous provisions. Now, when we look at the Water Act, the objective is to provide for the prevention and control of water pollution and the maintaining or restoration of wholesomeness of water for the establishment with a view to carrying out the purposes aforesaid of boards for the prevention and control of water pollution, for conferring on and assigning to such boards powers and functions relating thereto and for matters connected therewith. So, the objective of, uh, of making the Water Act of 1974 is prevention and control of water pollution and maintaining or restoring the wholesomeness of water. Now, to this end ha, and here we also saw that this power is not with the parliament and so this act was made in pursuance of clause 1 of article 252 of the constitution. So, these states passed resolution in all of their houses saying that in this matter the parliament should make a law and so the parliament is making this law. Here again when we look at the sections, you have preliminary sections. Then the central and state boards for prevention and control of water pollution which today are known as the central pollution control board and the state pollution control board and it deals with all the matters related uh, with them. Terms and condition of service, disqualification, vacation of seats, meetings of board, constitution of committees, temporary association of persons with board for particular purposes, vacancy in board not to invalidate acts or proceedings, delegation of powers to chairman member secretary and officers and other employees of the board and so on. Then chapter 3 deals with joint boards for two or more states. So, constitution, composition and special provision. Then we have powers and functions of the board, functions of the central board, function of the state board and power to give directions followed by prevention and control of water pollution. So, in this case, the power of state government to restrict the application of act to certain areas, in which case the, the, central, uh, the, the state government can say that the water act will not apply throughout the state, but only to certain areas. Then power to obtain information, power to take samples of effluents and procedure to be followed in connection therewith, reports of the result of analysis on samples taken under section 21, power of entry and inspection prohibition on use of stream or well for disposal of polluting matter, etc., restrictions on new outlets and new discharges, provision regarding existing discharge of sewage or trade effluent, refusal or withdrawal of consent by the state board, appeals, revision, power of state board to carry out certain works, furnishing of information to the state board and other agencies, emergency measures in the case of pollution of stream or well, power of board to make application to courts for restraining apprehended pollution of water in streams or wells. And in these cases, we saw that if the board is doing something, if it is doing something as an emergency measure 
or if it is putting a case in the court, then all the expenses are then taken from the polluter following the polluter pays principle. Then you have power to give directions appeal to the NGT. Now here we have funds. So, there are contributions by the central government and contributions by the state government. There is a fund of the central board and the state board. The <coughs> boards also have borrowing powers and, big, and they also make their own budget. Now, because you have um, these funds, so there is an annual report and account and audit. And these reports and uh, the account and audit reports, they are placed before the parliament or the state legislature as the case may be. Then we have penalties and procedures, failure to comply with directions, penalty for acts, penalty for contravention. So, in this case you have different penalties for contravention of different sections and you also have the provision of enhanced penalty after previous conviction. Then we have the option of publication of names of offenders and in this case as well the cost of this publication will be recovered from the polluter. Then we have offenses by companies where the head is responsible together with all the other officers that were involved. Provided that they can uh, be let go of their liability if they are able to prove that the uh, offense was done without their knowledge and they had taken all due diligence to ensure that this offense is not done. Similarly, in the case of offences by government departments, the HOD and the other officers that are involved, they are held liable until and unless they are able to prove that it was done without their knowledge and uh, they had taken all due diligence. Then we have cognizance of offences, members, officers and servants of the board to be public servants, followed by miscellaneous provisions including the central water laboratory, state water laboratory, analysts, reports of the analysts local authorities to assist uh, the members of the authorities and the board, compulsory acquisition of land for the state board, returns and reports, bar of jurisdiction, protection of action taken in good faith, overriding effect, power of central government to supersede the central board and joint board, power of the state government to supersede the state board, power of central government to make rules and power of state government to make rules. Then we looked at the AIR Act. Now, the AIR Act is very similar. It was made in 1981 and it is to provide for prevention, control and abatement of air pollution. There we were talking about water pollution, here we are talking about air pollution. For the establishment with a view to carrying out the aforesaid purposes of boards, for conferring on and assigning to such boards powers and functions relating thereto and for matters connected therewith. Now, in this case, we saw that the chapters are very similar, the provisions are very similar with a few distinctions. That it says that, if, that the Central Pollution Control Board will also have the powers relating to the AIR Act and if the State Pollution Control Boards have been made under the Water Act, then they will also have uh, powers under the AIR Act. If they have not been constituted, so in that case it provides for the constitution of another board. So, apart from these minor variations, we find that all of the provisions or most of the provisions are one and the same. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.